That's his first step in answering it. The authors reviewed the literature on fetal pain and fetal anesthesia and analgesia. Now, their evidence acquisition in order to reach their findings consisted of the following. They reviewed English language articles involving human participants and searched PubMed for articles on fetal pain. They found 16 articles. Articles on fetal anesthesia, they found six articles. Article on fetal analgesia, they found three articles. Fetus uh, and anesthesia or analgesia, they found 1,239 articles. Medical subject headings using the terms analgesics, administration and dosage and fetus, they found 44 articles. MESH, anesthesia, administration, and dosage, and fetus, they found zero articles in that. Searching under neurodevelopment or development or anatomy, and fetus or fetal, and pain or nociception or noxious, they found 306 articles. Searching under terms thalamocortical or thalamus or cortex, and fetus or fetal, and pain or no susception or noxious, they found 13 articles. Searching under terms electroencephalog or EEG o revoked potential and fetusor, fetalor premature, neonatior premature, infantor preterm, neonatio preterm infant, and pain or no noxious consciousness, they found seven articles. The search was performed without date limitations and was current as of the date of this article. And from those search results, they excluded articles that did not study fetuses of less than 30 weeks gestational age or that did not specifically address fetal pain perception or nociception. With a focus on topics addressed by earlier review articles on fetal pain, anesthesia, and analgesia, Articles were reviewed for additional references. The synthesis of that evidence uh, in this journal entry was that pain is a subjective sensory and emotional experience that requires the presence of consciousness to permit recognition of a stimulus as unpleasant. Although pain is commonly associated with physical noxious stimuli, such as when one suffers a wound, pain is fundamentally a psychological construct that may exist even in the absence of physical stimuli as seen in phantom limb pain. The psychological nature of pain also distinguishes it from nociception, which involves physical activation of nociceptive pathways without the subjective emotional experience of pain. For example, nociception without pain exists below the level of a spinal cord lesion where reflex withdrawal from a noxious stimulus occurs without conscious perception of pain. And they have a diagram to indicate what they're talking about there. And they find that because pain is a psychological construct with emotional content, the experience of pain is modulated by changing emotional input and may need to be learned through life experience. Regardless of whether the emotional content of pain is acquired, the psychological nature of pain presupposes the presence of functional thalamocortical circuitry required for conscious perception as discussed below. Nociception may be characterized by reflex movement in response to a noxious stimulus without cortical involvement or conscious pain perception. Nociception involves peripheral sensory receptors whose afferent fibers synapse in the spinal cord on interneurons, which synapse on motor neurons that also reside in the spinal cord. These motor neurons trigger muscle contraction causing limb flexion away from a stimulus. In contrast, pain perception requires cortical recognition of the stimulus as unpleasant. 
peripheral sensory receptor afferent synapse on spinal cord neurons, the axons of which project to the thalamus, which sends afferents to the cerebral cortex. By activating any number of cortical regions, sensory receptors and spinal cord synapses required for nociception develop earlier than the thalamocortical pathways required for conscious perception of pain. Now, once again, I refer to the section of the bill. The state has a compelling state interest in protecting the lives of unborn children from the stage at which substantial medical evidence indicates that these children are capable of feeling pain. The abstract that I just read to you refutes that. There are other articles that refute that as well. I want to go to the bill analysis of the bill and read that section in the bill analysis. Mr. President. This, uh, I've been waiting. I, this Senator may be a good time for me to ask questions if Senator Davis would uh, allow me to do so without yielding the floor. Not at this time, Mr. President. And do you have a, a, an idea of how long you would want to wait? I'm not sure at this point. Uh, would, would you hold for a moment? Uh, Senator Davis has the floor. I'll come back to you. Could you hold just for a moment? Yes, sir. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm going to read the, the bill analysis, and there, of course, is a section here that deals with the fetal pain issue as well. Um, this is the bill analysis prepared on June the 14th, 2013, to the substituted committee report to com the uh, committee substitute Senate Bill 5, prepared by the Senate Research Center. Under the section about the author's sponsor's statement of intent, it states that at 20 weeks post-fertilization, scientific evidence suggests that preborn children are capable of feeling pain as all the neuroreceptors for pain are in place and functioning. Myriad peer-reviewed studies have found anatomical, behavioral, and physiological evidence that the developing preborn child is capable of experiencing pain by 20 weeks post-fertilization. A 2007 study by the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Arkansas for Medical Science states that fetuses undergoing intrauterine invasive procedures definitively illustrative of pain signaling were reported to show coordinated responses signaling the avoidance of tissue injury. Preborn pain laws similar to this legislation have been passed in other states. What this doesn't indicate, of course, is that those have been subject to challenge, and those challenges have been, at this point, uh, successful. Committee substitute to Senate Bill 5 establishes a separate and independent compelling state interest in protecting the lives of the unborn children from the state at which the medical evidence indicates they are capable of feeling pain. Mifeprex RU486 was approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration, FDA, for use by pregnant women wishing to terminate a pregnancy for up to 49 days gestation only. The drug has no other approved indication for use during pregnancy. The RU486 label instructs that tablets are intended for oral administration only and should be administered only in a clinic, medical office, or hospital and by or under the supervision of a physician able to assess the gestational age of an embryo and to diagnose ectopic pregnancies. Abortion-inducing drugs pose substantial risks to women, and these risks are magnified when the drugs are misused. 
The purpose of committee substitute to Senate Bill 5 is to protect the health and welfare of women considering a drug-induced abortion. It ensures that physicians providing drug-induced abortions are only doing so in the way in which the FDA tested and approved the abortion-inducing drug. And, of course, we had a tremendous amount of testimony during the debate on this bill about that particular provision and about whether uh, that actually is in keeping with medical evidence that's been learned by practicing physicians with the use of this drug. Uh, Senator Van de Pute, of course, made a compelling argument as a pharmacist about the fact that were the provisions of this bill to go into law as they're discussed here in the bill analysis, it actually controverts the medical practice, the current medical practice and use of that drug for purposes of medical abortion. And it does that because over time, what doctors who administer this drug have found is that women who have been administered the drug, number one, need far lower dosage than what the FDA had originally uh, put in place. And also, number two, that using the drug, especially on the second day, uh, through vaginal insertion versus oral administration, actually produce much better and safer outcomes for the patients. As a consequence of that, we worked on making changes to that, but this amendment that came over from the House, I do not believe, in included uh, the amendments that were made to try to acknowledge and, and put into place Senator Van de Pute's concerns that she justifiably raised with regard to that particular provision of the bill. Committee substitute to Senate Bill 5, according to the bill analysis, requires that Texas abortion providers meet the basic standards prescribed by the manufacturer of RU486 and the FDA. And again, those are in uh, direct contradiction to the use of the drug today that medical practitioners have determined to be safest for women. And of course, it begs the question that we've talked about earlier today about legislators stepping into the role of medical providers and making decisions about administrations of drugs to women under the argument that doing it in this particular manner is safer when, in fact, practicing medical professionals have found otherwise. The concern being that through this legislation, we actually are creating a less healthy climate for women who might take this drug than they, there would be um, under the ways that physicians are currently administering it. Committee substitute to Senate Bill 5 also requires that the woman receive the name and telephone number of the physician or other health care personnel who will handle emergencies that arise from the use of the abortion-inducing drug. And finally, the physician must provide a written report of adverse events to the FDA MedWatch reporting system. Now, members, I firmly believe that had those been the sole provisions in this bill, there would have been uniform support, uh, both of which provide ways that I think we would all find common agreement, create a safer climate for women who are undergoing abortion. One that the woman, as she leaves the abortion clinic, I do believe this is the practice today, but it certainly doesn't hurt to assure that it is more than just a practice, but it's actually a requirement, that as women leave a facility, they be given the name and telephone number of the physician or other health care personnel who will handle emergencies that arise from the use of the abortion-inducing drug. And that makes sense, of course. And that the physician should give a report on adverse events to the FDA. MedWatch reporting system makes excellent sense Mr. as well. Mr. President, 